Hi, welcome back to Central Line. I'm your host, Katie Berlin, and with me today is a returning guest, Kelly Johnson. Kelly, welcome back to Central Line. Thank you. It's so great to have you back for conversation part two. Um, We're going to be talking about a different topic today, which we touched on the first time we chatted. Um, But Kelly, if you'll remember, um, we the, in our previous conversation, we talked about uh, being a veterinary receptionist and um, how we can empower and grow the careers of our um, our veterinary reception teams and make sure that they are empowered to use all of the special skills that they have. And so if you've missed that episode, go back and check it out because it's really good. But you don't have to have heard it first to hear this one. So it's so FYI. Kelly, would you mind, um, we're going to be talking about grief today and grief, you know, it sounds like it's going to be a real bummer of an episode, but talking to you is like the opposite of a bummer. Talking to you is like a ray of sunshine. And so I have a sneaking suspicion. That's one of the reasons you're so good at your job, but, um, would you mind just giving us a little bit of your origin story for how we come to be talking about grief today? Um, when you were, you know, your last conversation with us was about being a veterinary receptionist. So I mentioned before I got into vet, uh, being a veterinary receptionist, I had gone off to grad school thinking that I was going to become an ordained minister. And I obtained my Master of Divinity degree. And that is a degree that also allows me to do chaplaincy. Uh, chaplaincy, be very clear about this. It is spiritual care for people Within a specific setting and a specific time frame, um, it is not for one religion. We are trained to utilize all religions, uh, including atheism, agnostic, paganism, uh, and the five major religions of the world. So we are highly trained to do all of these things. And in addition to my master's degree, I have obtained two units of CPE, which is clinical pastoral education. And that is a rotation training for uh, budding chaplains. And that is, I have t- obtained 800 hours so far. I have another 800 hours to go for my- it's a lot of hours. <laughs> it is a board certified training. So that's why I want to be really clear about what is a chaplain first. Uh, people think of the the priest in MASH a lot of times when I th- say chaplain. Mm-hmm. That is not chaplaincy today. Uh, that It does not mirror that. We sit with people in times of trials for the most part. We are there as uh, a mirror spiritual guide, spiritual companion, not religious companion, a spiritual companion. So I started out my training with that. And then I, as we we talked about before, I, I accidentally ended up in veterinary med. And I had the opportunity to go and work in different hospitals and experience them because I was working for a large corporation. And one of the places I went and worked was at an ER, uh, a really busy hybrid hospital. And one day I was working the intake portion of their hospital. And this woman came running in. She had a string tank top, short shorts, flip flops. She clearly was getting ready for bed. And she started screaming, my boxer, my boxer. And that's all she could get out. I hit the code blued. People came running. And they they took the patient right back. Took her into a room. And her husband came in wearing athletic shorts, no shirt, no shoes, and clearly holding an infant. Not, not just a baby, but an infant, a newborn. And... The patient was unfortunately DOA, and this woman could not sit in the room with her pet, and there was nowhere else for her to go, and she was sitting in our lobby. I I can still hear her screams. Um, And what haunted me was, my job is to be here for the next emergency. Sorry, it still chokes me up a bit. I cannot go and take care of you. Because my job is to be ready for the next emergency. The next person needs me to be here. And I left 
that shift and thought, we can do better. I can do better. I'm trained for this. So there was a whole lot of backlog of me preparing for a moment that I wasn't sure would come, but leaning into my passions. And then the moment arose. And I put together a one-page proposal and another page of all of my qualifications to do this, and I presented it to the hospital management. And the administrator had me come back, and we had wonderful conversations about this. And along the way, I got a lot of yeses. Yes, we're going to try this. Yes, we're going to experiment. Oh, you're doing a training program? Great. Then we'll, we'll be your site that you can utilize for this training. Um, a lot of yeses along the way. And we ended up developing a grief care program alongside a veterinarian. So if there are veterinarians out there who do have a passion, there's a place for you. Uh, I worked with Dr. Susan Holt, who uh, has her own euthanasia business, but also practices in a, a local practice. And she and I weekly had uh, support group meetings where I could talk a lot about the psychology and spirituality of grief, and she was able to provide a lot of insight into the medicine and the um, differentials that doctors use to make determinations and when to decide that euthanasia is possible. So this is kind of the origin story of how I got into this, and I want to highlight the yeses that came along the way the let's give this a try, let's see what happened. It went from, I think, four or six hours a week to being my full-time job at that hospital. And I would send out letters to every client who lost a pet. And some weeks that was up to 100 people that I was contacting. Again, very busy, large specialty and emergency hospital. So I know this is not common. But everyone got a response back within about 14 days. How are you doing? Do you have questions? Do you have concerns? Do you need someone to talk to? Uh, I'd say about 10% of the people got back to me. Uh, 10 to 15% of people returned a response and let me know. Um, some people did want more or did want to speak with the doctor. But it saved the doctor's time to have somebody respond back on their behalf and then only have to really respond to the ones that had questions remaining. And it was a wonderful, wonderful program that we had there. That's amazing. So you this is something I can relate to because um, I'm an overcommitter. <laughs> but like you saw a problem. You saw a gap in what your hospital was able to offer, um, and you knew that you could fill it or help fill it. And so you took it upon yourself to write this proposal and submit it and make sure that the conversations were happening. And then you got yeses because you successfully conveyed the value of this mm -hmm. idea. And then you put it into practice. Just boom, you got her done. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine at an an average general practice, which is probably the majority of the the practices, you know, where people who are listening work, um, you know, you're you're looking at quite a bit fewer than a hundred euthanasias in a week, um, and which is good, and yes. um, and it's actually quite doable to contact them with this direct kind of communication, and it's different from kind of the standard communication that I think we oftentimes will do, which is like, oh, your pet's ashes are back, you know, um, or we'll send a, a card, you know, a sympathy card. But this is actually basically saying we are asking you to come to us. We are welcoming you to come to us with questions or concerns, which a lot of people probably have and many people don't reach out for if they're not directly asked. It's a way of saying our relationship has not yet ended. Yeah. We're still here for you. Uh, yeah. We we still value you, not just not just the money you brought in with your pet, but we yeah. value the relationship we have with you. And the reason I do 10 to 14 days is 
on average, that's when your so your support networks stop asking how you're doing anymore. So to step in in that space and mm. the the vacuum when people are really feeling the the start of feeling alone, to step in and say, "Hey, we're still here. This profession understands the immense bond." How are you really? I mean, there, yeah. there's how are you doing, which, by the way, if you're in Massachusetts, you understand that is a, how you say hello. It's not actually a question. <laughs> they don't really want to know. <laughs> no, hey, hey, how are you? So I'm calling about, I was like, Wait, no, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Um, this is part of my Midwest sensibility. It's actually a question. So how are you? I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing OK. OK, but how are you really? Mm -hmm. It's the how are you really? And the second answer is the one that's important. And I loved being able to do that with people. How are you really? Because I work in this industry and I, I get this is a huge bond that's missing in your life. Yeah. And so many workplaces, even family members might not understand that oh you're still goodness, feeling no. that loss so bitterly after only a couple of weeks. I mean, any kind of grief is so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. um, and it is really hard to have, you know, it's great to have an outpouring of support at the beginning as um, if you're lucky enough to have that, that can be so comforting. But then to have everybody kind of disappear makes you feel like there's something wrong with you if you're not fine. And almost no one is fine. When I lost my dog, Beth, um, and the team was fabulous, by the way, absolutely fabulous. And I want to give a, a huge out a shout out to Dr. Cindy Lopes, who like navigated that water between client and colleague and a terminal diagnosis that just was was horrible. Um, first of all, that, that's just so hard to navigate those waters. But about six months later would have been her birthday. Mm. And I started driving to work and the thought of going in there when she was gone and it should have been a celebratory day. And um, I, I broke down. I couldn't even drive. I pulled off to the side of the road, called into work. And they said, don't don't bother coming in. Just just take the day. Go home. Like this is happening within our own team members. Yeah. It's definitely happening with the general population. Yeah. Um, who have so much less context and information around around that loss in so many cases, especially on emergency. You know, there's a large percentage of pets that you see come through the door that probably aren't just like very, very old, you know, mm -hmm. that have had things happen and had illnesses come up and had things that were unpredictable that happened and resulted in the euthanasia or the death of that pet. And that is so, so hard for people who just don't have the background that we have. Um, and maybe st no matter how much we explain, they're not in a position to understand right yeah. now. That is so, so hard. Um, it's just this, this like unresolved grief. Um, and I'm glad you brought up, you know, if it's happening with your team, because it is like, we all have pets, like we all have pets and most of them have something wrong with them because that's how veterinary professionals work. Right. It's like, well, we get the, the weird broken ones, ones always the, find us. They do. And well, and we're in the place where a lot of the weird ones come and then where they're, they're safe haven. Right. But like, <laughs> there's so much, like our relationships are so special with our pets. And when we lose them, it still doesn't feel you know, people understand that like the next day you're not going to be okay. Um, but it still doesn't feel like there's a culture where it's like, take as much time as you need. Um, what can, what can practices do to support their team members better when they lose their own pet? So I'm going to start off by saying, uh, hospital management, I see you. I know that we are all short staffed and not everybody can afford to do this. But if you ask your team members, hey, um, Haley just lost her dog, Scruffy. Can people step up and help her out so she can have some time off? I bet you people would step up for each other. I, I really do. Ask people. Um, let them know what happened because we want to be there for each other. So 
I see you. I know you're short staffed. I know you are trying to make things work. So please don't hear any of this as like, oh, great, one more thing to figure out. I'm just going to come at it from the employee side of things. Mm -hmm. And one is give your staff time off. Please. It creates such an emotional and moral injury for us to have to come in after losing our pets and take care of someone else. It, it It's just so incredibly hard. And there's really no way to come back from that level of injury. Uh, it, it builds resentment. It, it's a loss of trust that you you don't understand how much this means to me. You know, if I lose, a, for a lot of places, a grandparent, but definitely if I lose a parent or a child or a sibling, I legally get time off. It's bereavement leave. It's an, a legal entitlement to time off. And as the industry leaders, how is it that we are not recognizing that our pets are a member of the family? If we don't recognize it, how can I ask anybody else to recognize it? We, we need to take the initiative. And I know a number of hospitals are. Um, they give one day off. I've worked in a place that recognizes the same level of bereavement leave, whether it's human or animal. And mm. I, it's the equivalent of a week off to yeah. mourn your pet. Um, and I, I do, I had to write this out, but there are terms that we use synonymously Grief is the immense emotion we feel surrounding loss. Bereavement is a time frame. So grief is internal. Bereavement is a time frame, chronological. Mm. Um, and mourning is the time frame in which we're expressing it. So mourning may go on longer than a week that we have time off um, and we may feel the grief longer. Mourning usually comes to an end at some point or it abates enough that we are not expressing it intently or um, overtly, but we can still be experiencing grief mm -hmm. for so, years. Yeah, they're they're not synonymous. And, and we talked about how the importance of language. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to highlight that is for our hospitals, it starts with a recognition of bereavement, that we need time away, mm -hmm. um, a chronological space. Mourning is a recognition that even if we've completed the bereavement period, there may be trickle effects. Maybe, maybe Haley, who just lost Scruffy, should not go into a DOA or a PTS for the next month. And when she feels like maybe I'm ready to try, uh, Janie is going to come in with her and they're going to shadow each other. And that way, if Haley needs to leave, I'm just grabbing names. Um, if Haley's like, I can't do this anymore, the client doesn't experience any interruption in their experience. But it's a way for... Haley to get back into the game and tiptoe into it. One of the things I did when we lost our dog, Beth, is I went into the treatment area and I also went into the room where we did the euthanasia. And I just sat in that space for a moment before I was expected to take care of others. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I can be in this space. I'm not going to lose it. It's going to be okay. And then, um, it, Grief is, is going to follow them for a while. It is going to be the cloud that follows Pigpen around for a while. And it, it's going to be okay. These are all normal human things that we experience. It's a part of the human experience. Do you think that if somebody, because grief is going to look different for everyone, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and so will mourning, like, you know, somebody could outwardly express that they're mourning the loss of their pet for two days and then seem totally fine. And somebody else could be mourning the loss of that pet actively and overtly for a year. And it is so individual. But 
if your practice gives you, say, a week, say they're progressive and say, okay, take the entire week off, um, or it's company policy, you know, that you shouldn't have to be in on a euthanasia until you specifically say you're ready or for a month or whatever. If somebody comes back and says, I'm ready now, and it's been like two days, um, and they don't want to take that full amount of time, is that something that you feel like we need to help protect each other and say, I don't know that you're ready. I think we're going to just like not do that right now. Or for some people, is that work healing and they need that to get better? That's so individual. I, I would is. say for practice managers, sit and have a chat. Mm -hmm. You know, have you thought it through or is it because you don't feel like you're fully participating in the team and you feel guilty for not being part of the team? Or you're Do just you trying not to be alone with your thoughts? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, when you're at work, I, I can kind of get that. Like when, um, let's, let me use Haley again. Haley comes back to work and I, I'll just say, so how, how do we want to deal with the elephant in the room? I don't want to talk about it. Great. We're not going to talk about it. Or, you know, maybe not now, but, you know, can we talk later? Or can can we talk away from work? Sure. Absolutely. Just how do you want, how do you want me to express my love to you? Mm -hmm. And part of that might be, how do you want to interact with work again? Do you, do you want a little time to tiptoe like my going in is just sitting in the treatment room for three minutes and watching everybody do stuff or just watching the next code that came in not being involved but just watching it and mm -hmm. getting my emotions up and out um you can't suppress them they will stay there until you deal with them so yeah. either deal with them here in in a safe space around people who will love and support you or do you want to deal with them outside of this space? It is really the loving question. Where do you want to deal with it? Here mm -hmm. or away? And if it's it's here, do you want support? What does it look like? Nope, I want to treat it like nothing ever happened and I'm going to deal with it out there. Great. I'm going to trust you to deal with it. Off we go. Yeah. It's so individual. Yeah. Um, but for for you professionals listening, you can't. You can't shove it away. You can't push it down. You can do that when you're on the clock, but you as a human cannot shove it down and just ignore it and make it go away. I've got too many clients who are dealing with the loss of a pet from like 40, 60 years ago mm -hmm. and, and are just now encountering it. it. You can't push it down to make it go away. Yeah. What about um, for team members in general after a tough euthanasia? Or, uh, you know, a spate of euthanasia is like they tend to come sometimes. Yeah. Um, what about self-care and how can we take care of each other in those scenarios? So in the moment, do you have time for the team to come together and debrief quickly? ER setting, you might not. Uh, general practice team, you, you might be able to just say, like, we're going to shut for three minutes. Um, I mean, unless something comes in urgent, we're going to just stop for three minutes and and talk. Mm -hmm. For the ER team, um, can you can you rotate out? If this team, this grouping worked on on this code and this euthanasia, there's usually another potter or grouping of people. Take the next one. Give them some time to to just breathe. I would also say. Um, Big fan of Bessel van der Kolk and his theory of the body keeps the score. Mm. Your body only speaks body language. You cannot wish away your emotions. Mm -hmm. You cannot think yourself out of it. So do some movement. Uh, can you go off to a hallway and do a little bit of yoga? Or I had someone recently just felt like they couldn't shake it off. Go in the bathroom and do some jumping jacks. Get your heart rate up. Sweat a little bit. Your body only speaks movement. It, it cannot translate it into anything else. Meditation definitely helps, but body speaks in movement, and you've got to move. So 
jog in place. Jumping jacks are a great one. Um, I mean, nobody really wants to do squats uh, or, you know, it, <laughs> what what are those weird ones called? You you go down and the burpees. Burpees. Yeah. Don't do burpees on, on the, the treatment floor. That's not a no, good idea. No. But find a way to move your body. Mm -hmm. 30 seconds. If that's all you've got, 30 seconds is really all you need to just get enough space until you can do it later. Um, I, I'm a member of NAMV and I work on the support staff side, very proud of, of being a, a moderator mm -hmm. on there. And one of the things I've recommended is staff members keep a little journal or a little notebook. The front half is all the good things that happened on my shift. The back half is all the things I wish I had done differently. And you write it out. The act of writing gets it out of your head because you've made it permanent on paper. You're less likely to ruminate. And That's every, so true. That works then, so well. Yes. And then every so often you go to that back and you rip those papers out and you vehemently shred them or you put them into the shredder with such intention because we're going to let go of the things that we didn't know once upon a time. I've learned from them now. They are a part of me, but I'm going to hold on to that good stuff. On the bad days, I'm going to go back to that front half until all I, all I have is a binder of the good stuff. Oh, I love that. Just go and shred so the old. Much. Yeah. But then also you're keeping it at work. Mm -hmm. Do that before you leave in your car or before you leave the building. Take three minutes, five minutes to write it down. And you're literally keeping it at work. Yeah. People have done it, have really enjoyed it. I love that exercise. And especially for people who, um, you know, for whom writing it's you know you you sort of have that tendency to want to put things down it comes very naturally to do that but interestingly as much as i love words i'm not a journaler i don't like i don't really like to do that and um it feels annoying to me to have to write things down that are already in my head because i'm like well no one needs to know this it's already in my head it is astonishing how well it works to get it on paper so that you stop, it stops popping up like that thing, you know, that you did in second grade that you can't get out of your head. And like, you'll wake up and be like, Oh, my God, I did that, you know, and it's like, won't die. Probably if you'd written it down, then it would be less likely to come back and haunt you today, because it's just been rolling around in there since then. Mm -hmm. um, definitely, I love that idea. And I'm going to start doing that too. Um, for myself, because it, it's it's such a good exercise to get in the habit of doing just like word vomit, the stuff that you don't want rolling around in your head forever. Well, it's so powerful to get rid of the things like I can let that go because I've learned from that now. Yeah, that's not yeah. what I'm going to do. I'm not going to use that phrase. Um, so one of the phrases I've eliminated is heroic measures mm -hmm. because clients understand it differently than we do. And I, I used that once and it just did not go well. I can let that go because mm -hmm. I've learned from it. It's never going to happen again. So the powerful shredding of that, this yep. is not who I am anymore. Yeah. This is who I remain. This is the authentic part of me. This AHA podcast is brought to you by Care Credit. Care Credit understands that all veterinary teams are busier than ever. To help patients get the care they need, the Care Credit Health and Pet Care Credit Card allows clients to access a budget-friendly financing experience anytime from anywhere on their own smart device. They can learn, see if they pre-qualify, apply, and even pay if approved, all on that smart device. With just a tap, they have a friendly, contactless way to pay over time for the services and treatments their pet needs, whether it be a general, referring, or specialty hospital as long as they accept the care credit credit card. Let's talk about another phrase that you hate. <laughs> um, you told me that you hate when we met, you told me that you hate the phrase time heals all wounds. Oh, Why please is stop that? doing that. Just stop it. Stop it, people. It doesn't. <laughs> um, so medicine people, you are my people. You will get this. Time does not he heal a cut on your hand. 
cells do that. Your your cells divide, literally divide and conquer. Uh, you you develop a scab that protects that space so it can heal, and those cells will knit together once again. Sometimes they'll leave behind a scar. Sometimes they won't. But it is you who are doing the healing. You are putting the energy. And I hate that people take their own agency from themselves to do this. Time is a venue that you use for healing, much like bereavement is a venue that you use for grief. So stop taking your agency from yourself. You are a powerful person who is in charge of your own healing. It also means healing is possible for you. I I, I don't want people to, to feel like, well, this happened to me and I'm never going to get past it. Maybe you won't fully get past it. There are some things that are so indelible on our lives that it it remains a part of who we are and the experience that we've had but it doesn't define us. And and so I I really I just so want to remove this from our vocabulary from our vernacular. Time does not heal wounds. You do. As a medical professional, you are healing wounds. As a person, you are healing wounds. And that is both physical, emotional, and spiritual. Own it. Own your personhood. <laughs> That that resonates with me so strongly because um, as somebody who's experienced, as we all have, grief and loss, and as most of us have, ha- who has tried to smush it down, you know, like when the trash can's full and you just like smush it and then put something else on top of it and you're like, no, it's not full. Like, not fine. We're, yeah, we're full. Like, got to take the trash out sometimes. And those feelings just sit there. And like, if you don't take it upon yourself to use the powers that you have and that you have access to, to heal those wounds. Time doesn't heal them. They just sit there. <laughs> and I like to think of, oh, they so come back up later. Shredders. Yes. Okay. CSRs, you get this. Those shredding <laughs> machines. Yeah. You can kind of shake it and move things around, but if you wait too long and you pull the bag out of the shredder, what happens? Those little particles go everywhere (laughs) and it's such a pain to clean up but once it's full if you just deal with it in the moment shake it down a little remove the bag it's clean yeah we are too if you keep pushing it down eventually those little particles are going to float over and it's going to take twice as long to clean it up i we're we're no different than a shredder in that instance. <laughs> That's good imagery. That's very good imagery. Yeah, um, I'm all about the images. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's good because that's how we remember things, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that. that's how it sticks in your mind, but it gives you power to say, okay, this is what's happening right now. I'm shredding. And I think my bag's getting full. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, those little pieces of paper will be on the floor forever. Otherwise, you can't, you like can't glitter. pick them up. Yes. Yeah. Uh, or those styrofoam packing peanuts that people used to use all the time. Oh, my God. Anyway. Okay. So in our first conversation, you and I talked a lot about, um, you know, you, you had said, stop telling veterinary receptionists that their job is hard. Like, tell us how we can find the joy. And there was something that you had said you wanted to bring up today, too, which is, um, you know, how I know veterinary hospice and end of life care teams will understand this especially but all of us in veterinary medicine have at some point had somebody say to us i could never do your job i don't know how you do this all day like how can we respond to that especially in the context of grief when their clients are looking at us and saying like i don't know how you do this basically implying that we are surrounded by death and our life is awful i i could never do your job i just cry all the time and mm-hmm. I find this never people, lands right. It doesn't. No. And I, what I find them really saying is, you somehow managed to deal with this. What's your wisdom so I can deal with this too? And mm-hmm. that's a very different conversation because sure. they don't realize how we're encoding it. And we can't ask them to do it differently. So we have to change the algorithm, as it were. I'm hearing. How can I survive this? Please 
teach me your ways. You know, um, they're coming to Yoda asking for, for the wisdom. And so how do we survive these things? Um, impart your wisdom wherever you can. You know, how do you do this? My answer is it's really comforting to know that if it's time to stop, it's okay. And there's a way to prevent the suffering. I, how do you do this job? I just cry all the time. Well, I do cry sometimes. Um, but in the end, I know that I've cared for you and to your and for your pet the best that was possible. And and I'm so grateful that you're trusting me with this. That's a very different conversation. They they don't care really um how we do this job. And yeah. nor should they, especially when it, it comes to end of life. They don't need to know how we do this. It's not about us. It's about them. And about them is, how do, am I going to survive this? This feels like I'm never going to, I'm never going to live again. Mm -hmm. My life has just stopped in this moment. And, um, oh, uh, David Kessler, uh, grief.com. Mm. He lost his son to just a, a very tragic accident uh hit by car and he he talks so much about meaning making and meaning making is not making sense of the loss he very clearly says there is no meaning to the loss yeah meaning making is what is my life after the loss mm. and that's what they're asking of us how do i make meaning in my life when scruffy's not here yeah. That that's powerful empowerment that only we can give. Yeah. Uh other people in their lives are going to try to give that but they don't experience that life death dichotomy the way we do. Um they don't come to euthanasia the same way we do. We we understand it so differently. Uh, that was one of the the hardest things for me to get my head around when I joined Vet Med was that concept of euthanasia being the good death. Mm -hmm. And they're coming to us in a way that only we can answer. And there's a good way to answer that is, I don't know, but I know it's possible and I know you can do it too. Yeah. Um, that is, that's super powerful. There are a lot of people that, in spite of this, um, you know, may not feel like they're the ones to go to. They don't feel like they're comfortable talking about grief. Um, and they're not, they don't want to say the wrong thing. Like, what is your advice for, for people in vet med who aren't yet there with these conversations? You don't have to have the right words. Being there is enough. Uh, to say, I don't know but I care about you. I, you are held in, in care and compassion is enough. You, you don't have to have the right words. And, and this is true in any loss, anywhere you go, people want to say some word of care and compassion. It, it, it's just a human thing to want to connect. And I've had people say things that they think are comforting to me, like, well, he's in a better place. No, better place is here with me. Are you kidding? Yeah. Um, Everything or, happens for a reason. I love oh, that one. Oh, please stop that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we were just talking about uh, things not that maybe aren't yeah, super helpful. Yeah, please stop using uh, everything for a reason or uh, at least the suffering is over. Mm -hmm. I'm suffering now. Yeah. Like the suffering's um, not over. I'm suffering. Was it one of the things that came up recently? And this came in... Uh, Direct response to some things that we said in our support group is, how do I say this now? Um, I'm trying to get myself back into that space. Lots of people will say, I would gladly take their pain to help mm -hmm. them. And I've said, you are. Their pain oh. is about to end and you are taking on that hurt so they don't have to hurt anymore. I have found that to be such a comforting thing to people. Ugh. Like, you know, I, I wish they weren't hurting anymore. 
They're not, but you are taking that on for them and you're going to heal it until it's no more. Yeah. I, but you don't have to have those kinds of words available. I mean, feel free to take these things from me. I, these, I don't, I haven't trademarked them. I, I don't have a copyright. Yeah. If you're not, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a copyright on these, but um, if you don't know what to say, just say, there are no words for this moment, but I hold you in care and compassion. That's enough. Yeah. That's I don't sufficient. remember a single thing anybody's ever said to me during a time of loss. I mean, unless it was outright offensive, but like, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember them. I don't remember them saying nice things to me. Like I just, because you're in your own personal hell at that moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. Like, Okay, I told I called you an onion at the end of the last conversation. You're like, yes, I will make you cry. And then I just got super misty thinking about that of just like the transfer of suffering that we willingly take on by sharing our lives with pets. That's a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. um, and it pays back the million little sacrifices that pets make without even thinking about it by just loving us as we are, like mm -hmm. in all of our glorious raw imperfections they just say you know what i need you and i love you and we are doing the same to them in that moment um and that's that's so beautiful and in our first conversation we talked about you know what's beautiful about the veterinary receptionist job where's the joy in that and like this is so sad sometimes to see people suffering like this and that bond is also so beautiful and you get to be a first hand witness to that bond in every case like this that's really, I love, really beautiful so you asked me before uh what is my my guiding principles mm -hmm. and when it comes to euthanasia i i try to be a dim candle in a dark room mm. there is still light as dark as this moment feels you are not alone and I will hold this flame until you can hold it yourself. And and maybe you're ready to hold it as you leave the room. Maybe you need a little time. Uh, but for me, that is the joy of being present for euthanasias or doing the disposition after a DOA. Um, by the way, my hospital has adopted. We have a, a treatment board and we put disposition rather than DOA. Mm. Uh, because they are now here for us to care for the body. And and yeah. I love that we've transitioned to that. Um, but that is the joy for me, is the assurance to somebody, we will care for your pet in a very respectful way. I will care for your emotions and honor them and see them for their true depth. And I'm going to have you leaving here knowing that you are not alone in this. This is not an isolating event. You are not in quarantine. Uh, you are seen and cared and loved. Uh, it, for those who are uncomfortable with euthanasia, if you can flip it over to, I am going to remind this person they are loved, even in the loss of a pet, it's, it's a I, I'm using the word powerful, but I mean, it, it is. It's awesome in the sense that it is a moment of awe to have that level of human connection. Now, mm -hmm. you have to love people. If you don't love people, you're yeah. not, you may <laughs> not experience this. Uh, yeah. But for those of you who really, you don't always like them, but you love people, mm -hmm. you are going to get this sense of humanity at its best. Yeah. And and that's what I love about this work is humanity and its best. Do you find, okay, last question, because in talking to some other providers of end-of-life care, um, Mary Gardner, Dr. Mary Gardner and Dr. Lynn Hendricks um, being two of them, Dr. Kathy Cooney, um, I'm thinking about conversations where you know, we've talked about compassion fatigue and feeling this just like piling up of all of this death and sadness. Um, and they seem to be some of the people that, and you seem to be some of the people that I feel like are the most at peace and the most 
um, willing to take on that, those situations of just like deep, deep sorrow. And I'm thinking back to my own experience of euthanasia of animals that I had seen grow up, you know, from young adulthood to being very ill with cancer, for instance, or um, with an unexpected illness, but I was very close to the owners and, and had gotten to know those pets well. And we walked each other through those situations together. And it was a complete circle where I felt like I had done everything that I could and made sure that those clients knew that they were loved. And I hold no fatigue from that. Mm. I hold only satisfaction and the honor of having been part of that process. The fatigue for me thinking back now is the sympathy cards that I just signed in a hurry on a busy day or the euthanasia where I wasn't there and the owner dropped off the pet, you know, and there was really hardly any communication between me and the owner or me and the pet. That's the stuff that builds up for me because there was no personal connection. There was no closure of I've done everything I can to make sure that this owner is okay, that this person is okay and feels held. Um, and that makes so much sense now listening to you that it's not that these heavy emotions won't feel heavy, but for me, the hardest part was feeling like it didn't matter, mm. you know, that I hadn't allowed it to matter because I was busy or because the system didn't allow for it. Yeah. So what do you do to make it matter? And, and some of that is like the, the letters that I would send out 10, 14 days later. Um, I have gone back in after a PTS and literally laid my hands on the patient and, and had a conversation with them internally. I've um, done that too. Like, oh. I, you know, I am so sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that you are at peace. This, um, especially with the hit by cars, like this should never have happened to you. You were a good boy and you will remain a good boy. And wherever you are, I hope that you are feeling the goodness and the joy that you brought into this world. Um, that is for me, uh, mm -hmm. much like when we go to funerals, it is not about the deceased. It is about the people who remain and them sharing the love with each other. I may not be able to get that from everybody else. Um, so how can I give it to myself? And I give that love to the pet. Um, it, yeah. it doesn't have to be a lot, but how do I find that satisfaction? Mm -hmm. And also, I've confronted my own mortality. That is a huge part of it not bothering me. Uh, mm -hmm. That also part of my grad school work is to confront your own mortality. I am a mortal being, and at some point, my time here will end. What have I contributed? What have I done? And that which I have left undone, can I be at peace with that? And and I struggle with that every day, every morning. It's a challenge. Um, but part of what I have done is if I cannot save, if I cannot do, can I at least make better? Mm. And you you professional staff the the medical focused portion of the team absolutely um i i know some days it feels like pushing the plunger for some days it feels rote and it hurts that this feels rote mm -hmm. um but know that if you cannot save you are relieving you are ending suffering you are living into euthanasia as a good death. And that can be sufficient unto the day that you have relieved suffering. And maybe you have done a ton of diagnostics. You have done everything you can. And even if the client is angry, you have done enough. Mm. You are human and you have done the human thing. I, I know we like to joke about being superheroes and scrubs, but at the end, you are Clark Kent. You are not Superman. You are not 
intended to fall apart in front of kryptonite. You are going to fall apart in front of the very human experiences that are uncomfortable. And it's okay. It's okay that it hurts. Life is full of hurt. Um, we are complex beings and we see multiple colors. So we don't have to live in rose colored glasses. We don't have to have only blue skies. Mm. Gray skies are beautiful. Rainbows are gorgeous. Uh, lightning is such an amazing picture to capture. And it's it's there and gone. Comets, northern lights. There are so many things that uh, are born out of discomfort and yet still contain some level of beauty. And death is one of them. It is, again, awesome is in the sense of full of awe to watch life transition to the next thing and to speculate what that entails. I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and living in that space. And that's a lot of what took care of my compassion fatigue mm -hmm. is that I spent the time in there and I know I can do it. Um, I can also walk away from that. Uh, somebody asked me one day again, how do you do this? And I said, well, it's not my pet. I care about your pet very much, but I don't have the history and connection that you do. And that allows me to help you in decision making. Oh, that's such a good point that nobody ever makes, right? It's like we we could not do it if it was our own pet all day, every day. We could not survive that. Oh, no. And no one could survive that. And um, and that's a key, key distinction that we can we can provide love and grace and assistance in that time it is not the same thing at all no would i i like to joke when i'm on the other side of the desk i'm an idiot yeah <laughs> i tell yeah, same. people how to name <laughs> how to make a payment how to use the medication like you know i read the label off the bottle for the people i don't like again not giving medical <laughs> advice but i'm reading labels mm -hmm. and when it comes to my own pet, oh my gosh, how do I make a payment? How do I get the card in here? What button do I press? Um, like, so, so how do I give this Rimadil? How often? What are the side effects? I know this stuff, but now I'm a client. Yep. And, and I, I'm, I'm an idiot. Well, I'm, I'm an idiot client. <laughs> yeah. I'm a crazy person. I'm a crazy person as a client. Like oh I'm gosh. insane. Yeah. Oh my so. gosh. So many questions. It's too much education. I know too many things to ask. <laughs> yes. Um, but it, but remember, it's it's different on the other side of the desk, and it's why it's yeah. really good for us to be clients and patients away from our own hospitals sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly, oh my goodness. Like, you are just, um, you are a gift to all of the people that you serve um, in this way and to the team that gets to work with you. Thank you for sharing your gift with us today. Thank you. And if your hospital is, you know, especially those smaller hospitals, I know that you can't hire somebody, but you probably have larger hospitals in your area that offer support groups. There are lots of people who are um, interested and trained how to do this. Go online. Uh, I, I have my website, Veterinary Chaplaincy. And if my space is not the right one for you, there are so many others. The Association for Veterinary Pastoral Education or petchaplain.com. Um, you can create some connections with people who can partner with you in this work. I know that it had been powerful at my other hospital when they could hand them the brochure of my pet loss support stuff and say, if you need help, here's the help for you. Like, and it, they left feeling like they had supported their client without having to take it on themselves, without having to be the expert. So if you're interested in that, if your hospital cannot offer it, partner up with people who can. I, I guarantee you someone will take up that offer and be grateful for it. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I will put links to resources that you named in the show notes as well, at, including your own site and um, your social media so people can get a hold of you. And um, I just I thank you again for spending this time with us today and um, for all the work you do. 
Thank you so much. I'm, it's just such an honor to speak to all of you about a subject I know is, is really heavy, but also rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to all of you for listening. We'll catch you next time on Central Line.